This morning I gave you the message, The Reason, and tonight I'm going to continue that thought, but I'm going to call it a little different. <clears throat> it sounds like the same, but it's not. The Reason for Christmas is the reason, uh, the message, the title of the message tonight. Now, reviewing a little bit from this morning, and if you didn't hear this morning's message, you can get it on YouTube, and please, please pray for the YouTube channel People are listening to it. I talked to a fellow yesterday for a good long while, <clears throat> and uh, he was very interested in some of the things that we talked about and uh, is going to listen to our YouTube channel. So aren't you glad that we have something that goes out beyond the church walls? So pray for, please pray for that outreach. But this morning we said that sin is missing the mark or coming short of the glory of God. And we also said that sin is an overstepping of a boundary set by God and that sin is the fundamental problem with mankind. And do we all agree? Sin is the fundamental problem with mankind. Now you say, what does this have to do with Christmas? It has everything to do with Christmas. Do you know what? Dr. Seitler used to have a Christmas revival every single year that I can remember. Why would Dr. Seitler, a man of God with great experience and great knowledge, why would he have a Christmas revival every single year at Christmas? I'll tell you why. Because people are prone to get away from the things of God at Christmas. And he wanted to make sure everybody stayed spiritually hot at Christmas time and also for souls to be saved. Amen? <clears throat> so in Christmas time, should we decline in our spiritual interest or should we increase? Increase. That's exactly right. So preaching on this subject of the fundamental problem of mankind's sin is necessary even at Christmas and especially at Christmas. But this is the miracle of the new birth. And he shall save his people from their sins. You ought to know pretty much where that is now, Matthew chapter 1, I think it's verse 21. Now, I want to present to you the first thing. I have a couple of points here. This is a dilemma. Now, what is a dilemma? A dilemma is a problem offering two possibilities, and neither one of them are very favorable. So we've got a dilemma. Which choice do we take? Sometime back, and I'm going to give you a story now to back up my thoughts here. Sometime back, uh, maybe six months ago, I'm not sure, Gail and I were conversing with a lady who worked in the Spartanburg school system. And she worked in the office of a large school very close by. And in that position in the office, she had many opportunities to deal with students and their problems. She was not a counselor. And she was not a school psychiatrist or psychologist or anything like that. She was just someone that manned the office, but she got to hear a lot of student problems and have their parents come in and involve their parents. By the way, this lady was a Christian, so she had the opportunity to talk to people about things of God. So we talked it with her at length, and uh, she was... Uh, sure that she could use her faith uh, at any opportunity, and I'm glad that she can do that, but I knew it wasn't easy for her to do that in that setting. <clears throat> so we talked about the plight of youth today, and we talked about the many pressures that young people face. And I brought up the subject that students today need to know about sin and being a sinner. How many of you think that's a good subject that students ought to know about? I thought it was a very wonderful idea. Politely, the school employee said that she never used the word sinner because it was just too negative. And she said the way I go about it is I ask the students what kind of choice you made to get you to this point and what other kind of choice could you have made to avert being at this point in this problem situation so she emphasized their choosing a certain uh, mode of action or whatever 
or choice. And so she never used the word sinner and she was politely telling me that it probably wasn't a good idea for students to know about sin and sinners. I heartily disagree. Don't you? How many of you think students ought to know about sin and sinners? That's what I thought. Yeah, I thought you'd think that. So the lady sounded very wise. But afterwards when I left, I had a sinking feeling. Have you ever talked to somebody like that and the conversation went on pretty good and you respected their views and they respected your views, but when you left you had this disappointing feeling? Does that ever happen to you? I left that conversation that day and drove away and I was, uh, I just didn't feel too good about what was said. I cannot even think about a Christian lady not wanting to mention sin and a sinner. So at least we had opened up a relationship with this young, with this middle-aged lady. And uh, so we went on with our lives and I guess she went on with hers. And then <clears throat> seeing that I was not so hot about the way she responded to my admonition to be talking about sin and sinners, I didn't think any more about it, but I said, one of these days, <clears throat> I'm going to find out where that teaching is coming from. How many of you know that somebody is teaching that? Somewhere, somebody is teaching these school employees, you don't say things like this or that or the other thing. <clears throat> and now they're teaching them you can't even use him and her. How many of you think that's pretty bad? That is pretty bad when you can't say him or her. Well, anyway, they're teaching them all these things, and the woke culture is definitely wide open now. So I didn't think any more about it. I said, that's just the way she had to be. She had to kind of conform to the school policies, et cetera, et cetera. Well, again, we were speaking to a lady recently, just recently, who had been involved in school work and also higher corporate work as well. And in those capacities, she dealt with people, sometimes teens, sometimes adults. She also mentioned the plight of youth today and especially the thought of suicide, which she said to me and to Gail, she said, suicide is at an all-time high among young people, teenagers. So here's what I looked up just so you get an idea. For people ages 10 to 14, the suicide rate tripled from 2007 through 2018 from 0.9 to 2.9, and they have a number that that goes by. And that did not change at all through 2021. It increased 62% from 2007 through 2021. In 2021, this is uh, uh, some things from the Center of Health and so on, uh, National Center of Health. In 2021, suicide and homicide were the second and third leading causes of death, respectively for people 10 to 24, National Center for Health and Statistics. And also, here's what the World Health Organization said. Over 1.5 million adolescents and young adults aged 10 to 24 died in 2021. 1.5 million. About 4,500 every day. That's the world now. That's not just the United States. About 4,500 are dying from suicide or homicide, violent deaths in the teen community. <clears throat> 4,500 a day. The facts add up and support the lady's statement that suicide is at a skyrocketing pace. She then told us, and I think I mentioned this to you, she then told us of a 12-year-old next door who attempted to commit suicide but was not successful. And at this point in time, this girl is 13 years of age and for the past year she's just been staring into space. She barely communicates at all and she's just a vegetable. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Isn't that sad? 
And their hearts go out to those parents, and my heart goes out to them. I don't know what can be said or done. Somebody said that one of the people there said they were very private people. But as we talked again to this lady and her husband and her mother, I said again the same thing I said to the first lady that was a school employee. I said, the students are being taught that death is the answer and they're not being taught about sin and sinners. And I thought I would get a positive reaction from another Christian lady and a Christian couple, but I didn't get that response that I thought I would get. She said basically the same thing as the other lady. I don't use the word sinner because it's so negative. And again, it clicked in my mind. That's what that other lady said. So how many of you know that somebody is teaching these educators that thought? Somebody's teaching them because it came from two entirely different people from two entirely different uh, situations far miles apart. <clears throat> So the reasoning behind her not using the word sinner was this. It's not good for their self-image. Can I tell you something? We need to realize the reality of who we are and what caused it. Sin is what caused us to be sinners. Amen? And that's a reality. And I think, this is what I think, I'm just giving you what I think. <clears throat> I think it's important to face reality. And the reason that I believe some people try to commit suicide and do commit suicide or involved in homicides or something else is they refuse or somebody is teaching them they do not have to face reality. By the way, all these crazy games about killing and shooting and all these other things, that's not reality. They're in an escape world, aren't they? They're escaping somehow into the violent world of these games. So I, I thought maybe I sh should shed some light on the subject. <clears throat> and so I told this second lady, I said, well, I think I've got some good news for you. And, of course, I'm uh, supposed to share good news, aren't we? I'm supposed to share good news. So I told her about the young lady that got saved at Calvary Christian School. And I said that when she first came <clears throat> to that service, she was glum and serious and had this kind of uh, face that was just unemotional, just a very serious, glum face. This two months later, after she made a profession of faith, I walked into the building and she was sitting on the front row with one of her teachers, and I didn't even know it was the same young lady. Her face was shining. I think I've told you, some of you have heard me tell the story about the Spanish guy that got saved in the prison ministry when we were in Morganton, North Carolina, <clears throat> and the, he got saved one uh, week night. I forgot which night we went over there to the prison, but the next week or two, whenever we went back, he came in with another Spanish guy that he had brought with him, and his face looked some, like somebody had taken a Brillo pad and washed it. It was shining like a new penny. I mean seriously, shining like a new penny. The countenance of his face had totally changed, and that's exactly what happened to this young lady at Calvary Christian School. <clears throat> so when I told the story about this young lady that got saved, not one that committed suicide, but one that got saved, the other couple that I was talking to really were excited and overjoyed by it. Now, I think we ought to get excited about people getting saved. I really think so. <clears throat> so I told them that this young lady didn't have a problem with me saying, do you know you're a sinner? How many of you think that's not a bad idea for me to say that? Do you understand that you're a sinner? The Bible says, for all have, somebody help me, sin. I said, she did not have a problem. She readily admitted that she was a sinner. She didn't have a problem with it. You say, preacher, it might have hurt her self-image. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You've got to realize you're a sinner before you ever have the right kind of self-image. 
Amen. That's exactly right. <clears throat> so here is the thing. Teens and everyone else need to know the reality of the problem that we all face. What is it? Sin. That's the problem we all face. <clears throat> God sent his son to earth to be born in the manger of Bethlehem at Migdal Eder, the tower of the shepherds. And Gabriel told Jesus, Matthew 1, 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's right. J-E is short for Jah or Jehovah. And uh, S-U-S is short for to save, the verse to save. So it means Jehovah saves. The very name that the angel gave to uh, Joseph and to Mary means, and you know it well, Jehovah saves, or Jesus saves. That was the first song we sang, Jesus saves. Aren't you glad he saves? Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You say, preacher, why are you saying it again? I'm so glad Jesus saves. Amen? I hope you get, you know, we ought to get excited about salvation, shouldn't we? Amen. And you know what the songwriter said. We have heard the joyful sound. We sang it a while ago. Spread the tidings all around. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. How many of you think a man wrote it? Somebody help me. Anybody think a man wrote the song? Anybody know? A woman wrote it. Well, thank God for good godly women. Amen. A woman wrote that song. Priscilla Owens wrote that song. She was, listen to this, a public school teacher. I bet she had a wonderful time telling her students Jesus saves. Don't you think so? In Baltimore, I think it was something like 39 years she served there. 49, I'm sorry. 49 years she served. And I guarantee you she told people Jesus saved. <clears throat> she wrote hymns for children's services. She was very involved in the Sunday school at her church. By the way, how many of you had teachers that were Sunday school teachers in the public school? Now I'm talking about public school teacher that was a Sunday school teacher. Did anybody have? I did. Several of my teachers when I was in grammar school were Sunday school teachers at different churches. Gail has some as well. <clears throat> so this Sunday school teacher and public school teacher wrote Jesus Saved. She wrote the words to this hymn for a missionary service in the Sunday school of Union Square Methodist Church. That's back when old time Methodism was doing a job, the right job. The song was originally adapted to the course of Viva Le Roy from the opera Les Huguenots by Giacomo Mayer's Cheer. Other songs by Priscilla Owens include We Have an Anchor. Have you ever heard that one? We have an anchor. Anyway, that's another great song. And then another one, Give Me the Bible, and Is Your Lamp Still Burning? She wrote those songs. Fourteen years after she wrote the poem, Jesus Saves, William Kirkpatrick married uh, his vibrant melody. I didn't say he married some lady. He married his vibrant melody to the words of the beautiful poem. So uh, Kirkpatrick brought the melody, and Priscilla Owens brought the poem. So we have spoken of two ladies involved directly. I actually have spoken of three ladies, but two ladies in the first part. In the education of teens, both of whom were reticent to say the term sinner. Then I spoke of one lady who had, I don't think, any problem. You see, when you say Jesus saves, you've got to say Jesus saves from sin. Amen. You can't say Jesus saved without what he saved you from. So I'm sure that Priscilla Owens would tell, after 49 years of working for the Lord, she would tell the students about sinners and sin. Yet this 49-year-old school teacher and church worker did not hesitate while others of this age hesitated. Now I want to ask you a question. Am I going to back off on telling people about sin and sinners. Do you think we ought to back off? I don't think so. Now, I understand that we have to try to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, 
And I understand that we have to consider feelings of people who may be in a crisis situation. And I understand that we need to make sure that uh, we're not uh, overstepping something that we should be more fragile, something more tender about. And so I need to be tender and compassionate. And by the way, anytime we talk to, sin to any sinner about being saved, it ought to be with tender compassion and a heart of love. Amen? Amen? So when I say, should I avoid the term sin or sinner, and I say, no, we should not, that doesn't mean I am hateful and mean and condemnatory. You know what? Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3, 17. So John 3, 16 says God loved. In John 3, 17, it said he didn't condemn the world. And I shouldn't condemn the sinner, right? Right? We should not condemn the sinner. So in that non-condemnation conduct, context, we should be careful about the uh, personality and the feelings of the person that we're talking about. So we should build a framework of trust and compassion before we talk to people about sin and sinners. We do not bully or blame. We present Christ as a person that loves them and died for them. Amen. Is that right? How many of you think there are probably some teenagers that need to be saved? If 4,500 a day in the world are passing into eternity, many of them without Christ, probably most of those, and that's across the world now, do you think that probably we have a wide open mission field? think so. So I want to give you some definitions of sin. So the first thing was the dilemma. I have a dilemma. Uh, the dilemma is a problem that has two responses or two choices and neither one is favorable. So my response of sin and sinner to that other set is it's unfavorable. And to me, their response of not... Uh, uh, saying anything about it, being reticent, is a, it's unfavorable to me. So I got a dilemma. Both responses are unfavorable to someone. So now let me give you some definitions of sin. I think probably these are something that you probably know but you cannot put to words sometimes, but let me give you a few definitions by godly people. How many of you like to know about godly people? Shouldn't we make godly people our friends? Shouldn't we read... From godly people. Yeah. So here's some thoughts from some godly people. This is Augustus Strong. Has anybody got a strong concordance? Anybody got a strong concordance? Tom's got a strong concordance. I've got one. If you don't have a strong concordance, I recommend you get one. He said, what's in a strong concordance? Well, it's got numbers and it tells you every word in the Bible and where you can find it and so on. And the meanings of the words, etc. So if you don't have a strong concordance, get one. Concordance. All right. Here's what Augustus Strong said about sin. Sin is a lack of conformity to the moral law of God, either in act, disposition, or state. That's a very simple definition, but very strong. Sin is a lack of conformity to the moral law of God, either in act, disp disposition, or state. Now, I don't know this fellow very well, Charles Hodge, but he is another uh, great Christian scholar. And here's what he said. Sin is transgression of or want of conformity to the divine law. Sounds very similar. And there's another commentary by Hodge, I'm sure. And here's James Oliver Buswell, Jr. Sin may be defined ultimately as anything in the creature which does not express or which is contrary to the holy character of the creator. That's what Buswell said. And then here's another one. And I like this one pretty good. This is from Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Anybody ever heard of Lewis Sperry Schaefer? Anybody? I'm going to tell you about him on purpose. You say, why? You need to know some of these people, and I need to know them too. Here's what Lewis Sperry Schaefer said. Sin is a restless unwillingness on the part of the creature to abide in the sphere and limitation in which the creator, guided by infinite wisdom, had placed him. 
Now, you say, well, preacher, does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's the unwillingness, a restless unwillingness on the part of the creature to abide in the sphere and limitation in which the creature, guided by infinite wisdom, had placed him. In other words, step out over the boundaries that God has given. That's that overstepping of the bounds. So I want to tell you about Lewis, Lewis Ferry Schaefer so you'll know who he is because I don't like to quote people that you don't know about. He worked with the YMCA as an evangelist. And Arthur T. Reed of Ohio uh, was somebody that he worked with uh, from 1889 to 1891. Schaefer attended Oberlin College where he met Ella Lorraine Case. They were married April 22, 1896 and formed a traveling evangelistic music ministry. He's singing and preaching and she playing the organ. In 1903, he became associated with the ministry of Cyrus Schofield. Now, how many of you have heard the name Schofield? One, two, three, four, okay. C.I. Schofield. How many of you have a Schofield Bible? There's one right there. There's another one right there. All right, if anybody wants Schofield Bibles, I can order them at a pretty good price. So let me know. I've had one for years and years and years, still got them in my library. And uh, so finally, I, I decided to get one with nothing in the middle so I, I wouldn't get uh, off base on some of my scripture reading. Help me in my reading. But I still like C.I. Schofield's uh, notes and so on. And I, I was raised on a Schofield Bible. First Bible I probably ever got, uh, the best Bible I ever got was when I graduated from high school, my mom and dad gave me a brand new Schofield Bible. And I loved it. I still got it. It's falling apart, but I still got that Bible. Anyway, C.I. Schofield is this guy got, got associated with uh, Cyrus Schofield who became his mentor. Lewis Ferry Schaefer is who I'm talking about. So Schofield became his mentor or teacher. He aided Schofield in establishing the Philadelphia School of the Bible in 1913. Has anybody ever heard of the Philadelphia School of the Bible? Anybody? Wow. That's an old, old school. Been around a long time. Philadelphia School of the Bible. C.I. Schofield started that school. <clears throat> When Schofield died in 1921, Schaefer moved to Dallas, Texas. Then in 1924, Schaefer, Lewis Perry Schaefer, and his friend William Henry Griffith realized their vision of a simple teaching theological seminary and founded Evangelical Theological College. And it is now known as Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, I know Dallas Theological Seminary now has gone way past where its founding fathers wanted it to be, but I want you to know that Lewis Sperry Schaefer and William Henry Griffith Thomas founded Evangelical Theological College, also known as Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, sin is a restless unwillingness on the part of the creature to abide in the sphere and limitation in which the creature, guided by infinite wisdom, had placed him. But now let me take the word of God. I like the Bible as my final authority. This is what John said. John's that beloved uh, apostle. And he said, sin is a transgression of the law. Isn't that pretty simple? Sin is a transgression of the law. First John uh, 3 Four, I like John and his Holy Spirit divine words. Sin is a transgression of the law. Now we have a Bible Institute here. I had one since 2011 and recently we had to stop because we didn't have enough participation. But here's what John Yates says about it. He says, sin is anything that displeases God or is contrary to his will or word. And I like that. It's very simple too. John Yates is a very simple person. Jesus was born in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago for this reason. This is the reason for Christmas, to save sinners. Amen? Sinners. You take the word sinners out of that, and it doesn't have much meaning, does it? Aren't you glad he saves sinners? That's the, that's the important word. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that his people means the people that belong to him. It doesn't mean just the Jewish race. 
So let's not forget the reason for Christmas. In our definitions for sin, we will describe sin in the following ways. So we have uh, the dilemma, and then I've got some definitions. These are all D words. And now I want to describe it just a little bit in closing. Sin, this is, a, this is important. Sin has not always existed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sin is not eternal. Is that right? Sin has not always existed. It is not eternal. Sin was brought into existence, was not, was brought into existence and into God's created universe by an unprovoked free will act of rebellion on the part of Lucifer. Sin was brought into the human race by the free will act of rebellion on the part of the first members of the human race. So sin is not eternal, has not always existed. Also, sin is far more than the absence of good. Sin is an active force. You know, when I hear these people on the television say, the force be with you comes from Star Wars, I think, doesn't it? I'm not much in the Star Wars business. I got a friend down the street. He knows every episode. And I got him to build me a computer because mine, you know, got hit by lightning and got all messed up. And after he built my computer, he downloaded all these MP3s or 4s or whatever onto my computer of Star Wars. And what do you do that for? Well, I thought you'd like all those episodes of Star Wars. You know what I did to every one of them? Deleted them. Took them all off. I, didn't want, I don't have time to sit there and watch all those Star Wars episodes. Well, anyway, he's a Star Wars fan. How many of you know there's Star Wars fans everywhere? Have you seen the stuff, the toys? Star Wars, everything. Everything Star Wars. The force be with you. You know what I think the force is? I don't think it's God. Do you? I think it's the devil or a demon. So sin is far more than the absence of good. It is an active force. Now listen to this. James chapter 1, verse 13 and following. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You know, there's really not much sense in saying the devil made me do it. We do it. Right? The devil, you say, well, the devil could have, the devil can influence you, but he doesn't make you do anything. Right? Yeah. The devil influences you. He puts the bait out there. But you're the one that takes it, and I'm the one that takes it. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Took the bait. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You say, well, preacher, what does that have to do with the Christian? You know, you can be a Christian and be involved in sin, but I'll promise you it'll make your spirit like a dead spirit. You won't have that vibrant excitement. You won't have that glow in the face. It will be a defeated Christian. So this, and there's all kinds of sin. So I could talk about a number of ones, but those are some. Don't let sin defeat you this Christmas. Somebody say amen. Do not let sin defeat you this Christmas. And I'm preaching to me, preaching to you. This goes both ways. Okay, so sin is far more than the absence of good. It's an active force. And then number three, sin is more than making a mistake. It is more than failure or weakness. Have you ever heard somebody say, that's just the way I am? Anybody ever heard people say that? I've had people tell me that. That's just who I am. That's just the way I act. Can I tell you that's not the truth? It is more than failure. It is more than weakness. We will never deal successfully with our sins while excusing them as weakness, mistakes, or uncontrollable emotions or desires. You cannot afford to excuse sin, and I cannot afford to excuse sin. You can say, well, this is, the Lord put that desire. He made me this way. Can I tell you something? That is a lie 
which is an excuse to sin. We better not make excuses for sin. Amen? We better not, you say, preacher, why do we do that? Because we don't want to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, so we make excuses for it. So sin is far more than making a mistake. It's more, more than making a, a failure or a weakness. We will never, never, never reach our spiritual walk with the Lord, a close walk with the Lord, while excusing our sin. So number four, sin always attempts to rationalize itself as good. The man who refuses to worship his creator on Sunday does not do so brazenly, admitting his contempt for his creator, but rather boasting that he has more integrity than the hypocrite on the pew. I don't know how many times I've heard that. They say, well, all the people at churches are hypocrites. Well, does that absolve him from his sin? That, that just makes him more of a sinner in my eyes. You know, if, if you're just always accusing the people that sit in the pew as hypocrites, you're worse than the hypocrite. Hey, you know, moat in your eye and beam in the other eye. But rather boasting he has more integrity than the hypocrite on the pew. Now, you know the publican and the sinner that went down to the temple to pray, and you know which one went back to his house justified. It was the one that said, Lord, be merciful to me. Uh, what's the word? Sinner. Sinner. That man had the humility and had the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I'm a sinner. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Luke 18, 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men or extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So can I tell you something? That man was excusing or moralizing or rationalizing that it wasn't so bad that he was good. Can I tell you something? When you have to argue with yourself that you're good, you're arguing with God, and God says simply, sin has wages. The wages of sin is death. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. So here's number five. As I close, sin cannot exist without good to oppose. In other words, if there was no good, there'd be no sin. That's the law. The Bible tells us about the law and sin. Sin seeks to attach itself to good like a leech attaches itself to a host. The goal of Satan is to corrupt the good things of the perfect creation of God. Do you know what Satan has done in, at Christmas? He has absolutely corrupted the celebration of the birth of Christ. Is that right? He's done it. We need to be careful that we do not let Satan corrupt us. And we need to stay vigilant about this matter of sin. Can I hear an amen? That's Christmas. That's what Christmas is about. Christ coming to save sinners. Let's pray.